Welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I uh, am sitting in the New York office and just kind of digesting a slew of uh, company reports. It's the busiest week of the year in terms of earnings season um, as far as the quantity of companies that release and it also happens to overlap with a, a lot of companies that we own. So it's really been a very interesting week because you've seen actually in individual company results be a catalyst for moving just two or three companies moving the market down quite a bit one day, up quite a bit another. So without a lot of macro news going on, we don't yet have final news on tax reform. We don't yet have final news on the Federal Reserve personnel. So individual company earnings take over and I suppose that's probably as it should be, but essentially um, in the midst of all the digestion of individual company results, uh, markets keep humming along. We like to think that as we go into the end of the year and certainly into 2018, that the expectation would be for elevated volatility. Um, you, you are now going to move into a little more clarity around where the, the political side ends up as it pertains to tax reform, most importantly, corporate tax reform. And I definitely believe that there is the possibility of a lot of uncertainty and volatility being driven around the Federal Reserve personnel. And it's ironic when I say uncertainty, because right now we're uncertain about who that personnel may be. Will he reappoint Chairwoman Yellen? I don't believe he will. It's not out of the question. Will he go with either John Taylor? My people I talk to say Kevin Warsh is now out of the um, consideration who was the candidate I really would have loved to have seen. Uh, current Fed Governor Jerome Powell is heavily rumored to be the favorite, but we don't really know. So there's uncertainty now. But then I believe once he makes the appointment, there's another round of uncertainty coming um, that will last much longer uh, around what that will exactly look like, whoever the person may be, and whoever the vice chair, one man or woman may be. Because you could end up, and, and I actually think this is a very distinct possibility, you could end up with, let's say, a Jerome Powell chairing the Fed and then a John Taylor as the vice chair. And you have two very conflicting ideologies and approaches to monetary policy. So the market then has to sort of digest the uncertainty of what exactly that would look like. Now, uh, trying to forecast that all of a sudden there's these certain events that are about to come that could elevate volatility has been a fool's errand all year. A lot of people have been mystified as to why volatility has not um, increased. And you can argue there's been a lot of reasons that would have justified it doing so. The fact of the matter is that for whatever reason, we've been in a highly compressed period of volatility. If someone said, David, what is the reason? With the gift of hindsight, I think you could say that the very accommodative monetary policy is allowed for risk elevation and risk premia to be compressed and then the heavy amount of money pouring into passive strategies, ETFs, index funds has enabled just a broad democratization of purchasing risk assets. I still don't think that really fully answers the question though because it doesn't speak as to why money has flowed into those asset classes and why it hasn't flowed out of those asset classes when there's been various sparks of of would-be volatility. At the end of the day right now, the um, fact of the matter is that the backdrop of global uh, conditions, both monetarily and overall economic health, has been conducive to risk assets going higher. So to me, um, I expect at some point volatility to increase because these are mean reverting things and we are far below the mean in terms of where uh, market volatility is. We are bullish, and, and there's something at DividendCafe.com that I think lays that out a lot better. I think that that term has to mean two different things. There's a sense in which, do you believe in the long-term return premium of equities as a way of monetizing and capturing future growth that stems from market enterprise and innovation and the profit motive. And, and the answer to that question is always going to be yes. It's a philosophical and ideological, but it's also empirically defensible. So long term, we certainly remain bullish in that sense. But understandably, a lot of people mean in the here and now, tactically speaking, 
I prefer not to even really answer the question, particularly on shorter term timelines, because it's unanswerable. But do, do we feel that there's an intermediate justification for equity prices to potentially move higher, even at these elevated levels? And, and I, think, I think that we do. We list out kind of the five major reasons that we could argue for at least maintaining that equity position. Now, as I've talked about in the last several weeks, we feel very guarded right now, very cautious. There's a defensive overtone to what we're doing. <clears throat> and we're trying to take risk out of the portfolio in other areas besides our equity element. So we want to maybe de-risk other components of our asset allocation, all the while maintaining an equity exposure that is already, frankly, very moderated, very, um, very reasonable. But when we look at the very low inflation, we look at the reflation uh, prospects around the globe, harmonized uh, economic growth taking place, um, when we see earnings continuing to accelerate, and, and the lack of euphoric silliness, the lack of typical signs of a market top, we're very willing to own selective equities. Uh, but again, in the context of proper risk management and understanding the untimeability of these things, and that's what I would plead with people to understand. This idea that one can pick an exit and then re-enter around their own instincts of market highs and lows is utterly preposterous. And I would challenge anyone who disagrees with me to be honest about whether or not they would have exited the market with those same instincts three months ago, six months ago, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, 24 months ago, et cetera. In some cases, five years ago. I know the answer. The same people that right now are asking me about are we frothy are people that were asking that six, nine, 12 months ago. It's understandable, but um, the reality is that the ability to have developed and disciplined asset allocation and stuck with it has done very well for people. And when we have a market downturn, it will do well for people. We just don't want to be excessively greedy. That's why we moderate and turn knobs on a client's allocation of assets in a manner that we think is conducive to their own um, return aspirations and risk tolerance. So next week, we do think we're going to get the House to approve the budget resolution that the Senate has already approved, which will be the next driver into reconciliation on tax reform. We also believe it's very possible that the president's ready to make his announcement on the successor of Fed governor chair. So those are two really significant um, things. Uh, and we'll be watching. It's certainly not going to be a short-term market issue we expect to respond to, but these are uh, substantive things that we have a lot of, uh, I've invested a lot of research into, and the next level of those things will be important to how we position going forward. I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. Please read DividendCafe.com this week. Reach out to us with any questions. For those of you who are clients, have specific questions on companies we own during this uh, very interesting earnings season. Happy to address that. Thank you for listening to Dividend Cafe.